Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot of information to you uh, to give you today, and I want to make sure we have time to get it um, to you. And so we'll just go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan Bainbridge. I'm a shareholder in the firm's Labor and Employment Group. And with me, I have Zach Thompson and Katie Collins, two of my favorite colleagues. And we're here today to talk to you a little bit about the employment life cycle. And so I'm going to start off, and then Zach and Katie will join later on. So today's seminar, you know, is a little bit different than many of our seminars, which um, I think a lot of you join us frequently. And, you know, we do a lot of specialized seminars on specific parts of the employment kind of, you know, world that you need to know about. This one's a little bit more general. It's um, Zach, Katie, and I are all litigators. We do, you know, obviously a lot of advice and counsel as well, but we see it on the other side. And so these are some of our best tips for you on how to manage the employment cycle, which is, as I know all of you know, kind of an incredibly difficult um, thing to do. It's probably your, one of your least favorite things to do about the whole, um, you know, employment. And so that's what today's seminar is going to focus on. And, you know, I think a lot of you, I recognize many, many names. So I think a lot of you attend a lot of our seminars. And so, you know, we have a lot of information for you, like we always do. We're going to move through the slides pretty quickly. Um, because of that, we're not going to be using the chat and the raise hand uh, little functions. We will have some polls sprinkled in to try to make it a little bit more interactive. We so hope that sometime soon we're going to be able to welcome you back into the office. Uh, we had hoped that by you know the fall we would be able to do that, and we're obviously not there quite yet. But we're just trying to get you know a little bit more involvement, a little bit more interaction um, to try to capture some of that, you know, the fun that we used to be able to have with all of you. And so we will be doing that. If you do have questions throughout the seminar, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we'll be looking at those questions as the next hour and a half goes by. And so um, we will try to answer them in there. Or to the extent we have time at the end of the seminar today, we can also answer the questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please throw them in the Q&A and we will get those to you. Um, and I, Ramona gave me a list of things I'd say. Oh, an e blast went out shortly before the webinar today with a copy of the presentation along with the information on how to request HRCI or MCLA credits. So if you registered late this yesterday or this morning, um, you may not have gotten that information. A second blast will be sent out after the presentation with a link to the recording of the webinar. If you have any questions about, you know, how to get your credits or anything like that, please reach out to Ramona. Um, she is the gatekeeper of all of that information so she can help you out. Um, the e-blast that you get will also include Lake Shore Labor and Employment Law Blog, as well as our firm's COVID resource hub, which unfortunately is still active. We were hoping it would be by now. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see if I can get this moving. There we go. So as I said, Katie and Zach are joining me. And we're going to start with where, you know, we would need to start with, and that's the pre-employment. So what you have to remember is employment laws in California don't necessarily just apply to your employees. It doesn't, you know, start once that offer letter is sent and accepted. It starts before that. It's going to, you know, it starts way back when you first are thinking about the position that you're going to be hiring for, the recruiting of that position, the um, application process for that position, the interview process, all of those interactions that you're having with the people who are applying to your job, those individuals are protected under California um, discrimination laws, you know, and that sort of thing. And so that's where we first start is um, just the pre-employment process. So first, let's talk a little bit about job ads. You know, job ads are important for a lot of different reasons. They're gonna, they're talking to the future employee. They're saying, this is what the position is and this is why we want you to apply to it. But there's important things that you have to remember not to include in those job ads that will um, cause you issues down the road. Let's see, I'm having trouble. There we go. So the first thing you have to note is employers must be careful not to run afoul of discrimination laws in their job, job ads. What does that mean? That means you're not including information that an applicant can argue can be used as or be considered discriminatory to them. So, you know, things that would focus on protected classes um, that we all know and love, um, you know, whether that's race, national origin, sex, 
um, religion, you know, whatever it might be. And so really the key in your job ads is to focus on the specific job duties, the experience, and the education required. If it doesn't involve one of those three things, ask yourself, why is it in your job ad? Is it important to be there? Should it be there? And can it be interpreted to be discriminatory in any way? So as um, for in furtherance of that, make sure there's a legitimate job-related purpose for anything that's in the, um, the ad, you know, as we discussed. If there's any sort of limitations on job duties or experience levels or anything like that, understand why it's in there and make sure it's a necessary thing to include. So for instance, you know, Zach, Katie and I are attorneys. Are you recruiting for attorneys? Then obviously a law degree is going to be required. And that's something that's for certainly okay to put in a job ad. However, if there is no education requirement other than let's say a high school degree, you know, put high school degree, but you're not going to be recruiting for something that requires an education level beyond or below what is required for that job. Um, must certain physical requirements be met? You know, that's going to largely depend on the job you're recruiting for. Are, you know, we're getting to wine picking for grape picking season in Napa. Is it a job where someone is going to be picking grapes day in and day out for three weeks? There are going to be physical requirements required for that job that are not necessarily required for an attorney position, let's say. So are there certain physical requirements that must be met? And is that a deal breaker? Is, you know, ask yourself is, we all know that, you know, reasonable accommodations are required of applicants um, as well as employees. And so is there a physical requirement that a reasonable accommodation could be um, used to, you know, allow that person to do the job? If that's the case, then maybe it's not something that needs to be lift, uh, you know, put in the job ad. However, if it's something that is an absolute requirement, no ifs, ands, and buts, someone has to be able to, let's say, lift 50 pounds, have repetitive motions, picking grapes all day, those sorts of things, then perhaps that's something that a job ad would be appropriate for. Must someone live in a uh, specific location? I mean, I think we're seeing this more and more and more um, throughout the last year and a half is that can jobs be done remotely? Can someone who is living in Minnesota do the job that you're advertising. Um, this is not the focus of today's webinar, but what I will just say is if you're hiring people in other states that you don't do business for, I, you know, I would consult with legal counsel because there may be tax implications and such that you need to consider doing that. But, or even if it's, you know, just someone who's living within California, your office is in Sacramento, you want to hire someone who lives in Redonda Beach. Um, that, or is it something that someone actually has to be present in Sacramento for? That might be something worth putting in your job ad. The key, avoid discriminatory language or any language that could be deemed or considered or interpreted to be discriminatory in any way. So let's do a quick poll. Which of these ads contains or which of the, these ad language um, contains potentially discriminatory language. And I will note that this is a multiple choice. Um, so you can choose as many that apply to you. So I think Ramona is going to launch the poll. Um, but as you can see, our family friendly company looking for a recent graduate must be clean shaven. Great opportunity for someone who wants to work from home. Which of those do you think has potentially discriminatory language? Anyone? Okay. Ramona, I can't see um, whether or not, or well, maybe I can now. There we go. Okay, so it looks like we have the winner is 80%. And actually, um, it was kind of a trick question because three of them contain potentially discriminatory language, and we'll go through that. But I think you all did a really good job of understanding that there are some, you know, while the language itself seems pretty benign, there are some potential issues. So let's go through those. One, family-friendly company. You know, it, it it's not something that I think many people think about because what's wrong with being a family-friendly company? But could a single person be looking at that and 
thinking to themselves, oh, I, I can't apply for that job because I'm not married and or they want someone with a family. Um, so potentially problematic. Um, what can you say instead? You know, great place to work, family, not family life, but you know, friendly environment, you know, something like that, that maybe takes that family word out of it. The second one, looking for a recent college graduate. You know, there are certain jobs that are more entry-level positions, and maybe that's what that uh, language is trying to convey. However, is someone who's 40 years old going to look at that and say, oh, I can't apply to that because I am too old? Um, so the, how could you phrase that? You could say something along the lines of, need zero to three years of experience. Put it back on the job requirements and, you know, find language that doesn't reflect on what could possibly be considered young or old. Must be clean shaven. Um, you know, there are certain jobs that have pretty strict guidelines, but you have to remember those guidelines must also comply with VIHA and there may be cer certain religious beliefs that require someone not to be clean shaven. That's something you should consider. Great opportunity for someone wanting to work from home. Probably not much issue with that. Don't forget about recruiting. So it's not just the job ad, it's how that job ad is distributed to others. So um, you have to make sure that the recruiting is equally accessible to all persons, whether um, you know, that could obviously be with physical barriers. It's it's something, you know, you know, if it if it's poster or you know, somewhere where it's just to people who can visually see, are there other ways that people can access that information? The EEOC has actually, within the last few years, really kind of um, gone after a lot of companies for the ways that they recruit. There was a series of about six or seven cases a year or two ago where they went after fairly large companies issuing citations for discrimination on recruiting um, advertisements. I don't know if any of you recruit on Facebook, but Facebook allows, um, you know, I'm sure anyone who's ever gone on Facebook knows that there's ads all over the place. And companies can uh, use tools to determine how those ads should be marketed and or targeted. And so what they found is that there were companies that were targeting ads to certain populations. And so that may be to males, it, um, in many cases was to young males and it, the ads weren't targeted so that typical um, things that, you know, women or older people would it wouldn't show up on their feed. And so, you know, the companies argued, well, that's not really that important because when it came to the actual um, application process, we were all legit and no protected classes were, you know, implicated. And the EOC said, that doesn't matter. You prevented certain protected classes from being able to even see the job postings. Um, and so that's why we say these laws start before you even hire someone and you have to think about um, how your recruiting is being um, crafted. Job descriptions. And so I, I know a lot of you have been to our seminars before and we talk a lot about job descriptions. And I, I think that, you know, a lot of, most companies are pretty good about determining and fit, having up-to-date um, job descriptions, but auditing your job descriptions on a yearly basis is so incredibly important in so many different ways. And one of which is recruiting and um, job application process. So yes, we, we talk about it when it comes to responding to complaints, auditing, those sorts of things. Um, but in this context, having an accurate job description is your first, you know, how you first craft what it is you're looking for. You should be able to look at your job description figure out what you need, and then articulate that in some sort of job ad posting sort of thing. And then it will help you as you go throughout the hiring process, accepting applications, choosing who to interview, choosing who's ultimately going to receive the job, because you know exactly what you're looking for, because you have an accurate current job description. And remember, it's not enough just to have a job description. It has to be current, it has to be accurate, and it has to be what that position actually is doing today or will be doing and not what that position did three, five, seven years ago. Um, it is critical that it's a current job description that it 
properly assesses the central functions of that job so that um, you know you know exactly what you're looking for and should reasonable accommodations or something along those lines come up in the hiring process you'll be able to point to those essential functions and determining whether or not an accommodation can be given so before you start recruiting for a particular position look at that job description for whatever position you have if there's not one create one if there is one ask yourself is it current is it accurate does it accurately affect, reflect what that position requires, what it does, what its duties are? Does it have essential functions for the job? If it doesn't, you should include them. Are those essential functions still accurate? Or do they accurately re represent what is truly essential for that job? Um, does it reflect what other people, you know, is this a position that there's eight different, you know, individuals who already do that job and you're just adding kind of to that team? Does the position accurately reflect, reflect what those other individuals are doing? Is any of the language problematic? Could you run into issues down the road where, you know, is it something discriminatory or along those lines? Um, so really look at and audit those job descriptions and make sure that, um, because that, and make sure they're accurate, current, and that's gonna be an incredibly helpful tool for moving along the hiring process. And then also for, I think Katie later on is gonna talk about the actual employment of the individuals. So you've, you have your job ads, you've recruited, you have then an employment application that someone's gonna fill out and um, hand back to you. Just a quick reminder, no questions about pro prob or problematic, no questions about protected classes are um, permitted. You can't ask about marital status, race, ancestry, disability, medical conditions, sex, gender, gender expression, gender identity. Pregnancy, children, religious affiliation, political affiliation, military veteran stat status. <coughs> I apologize. You can invite the applicants to share about their military service and experience in the work experience, because obviously that would be ad accurate or um, important work experience for them to share. But you can't say, are you a veteran? Check yes or no. Age, date of birth. You can ask if it's necessary for that position, if the job applicant is over 16, 18, 21, whatever it might be in order to meet the minimum age requirements for that position. For instance, if someone um, would be serving alcohol or something and they need to be a certain age, um, absolutely okay to say, are you over this age? But you can't say, what is your age or what year were you born? Uh, two things that are important to make sure you include. Um, a reference check authorization. Zach's going to talk a little bit in a minute about um, kind of the verifying someone is who they say they am, they or say they are. So you want to make sure that you've given yourself that opportunity by permitting um, you to do a reference check. You also want to include a statement that all answers are true and correct, and an anomish and oh, I can never say this word. An omission, that an omission or false statement is grounds for rejection or termination. So you just want to make sure that they've said everything in this application is accurate and true. Uh, can an applicant perform duties with her with a reasonable accommodation? So I said you can't ask about disabilities. You know, do you have a disability? Do you have a medical condition? You can say, can you, can you, the applicant, perform the job duties with or without a reasonable accommodation? that's okay. Um, and then if they say yes, that would be something you would then inquire into later on in the process. You know, one thing that's coming up um, now is, do you have, does your company have a mandatory vaccination policy in effect? Can you ask someone during the application process, are they vaccinated? You know, uh, this is all very new, so that we don't have a lot of case law, administrative law, statutory, you know, there's not a lot out there yet, but I think, yeah, you probably can. If you want to, I don't know. That, you know, do you want to invite that information at that stage? Um, I don't know, but can if you um, do have a vac mandatory vaccination policy that affects all of your employment, you know, I think that you probably can put it in your application. Just make sure to note, you know, put a little footnote or something that says reasonable accommodations will be considered for the religious and medical um, accommodations that are required. No prior salary history. So remember, I don't know how long ago it was, probably three or four years ago, maybe more. Uh, California Labor Code 432.3 was instituted. 
It prohibits an employer from relying on the salary history information of an applicant for employment as a factor in determining whether to offer that applicant employment or what salary to offer. Essentially what this all started because there were concerns that, you know, if there was institutional or historical wage discrepancies between uh, males and females, that asking prior history, uh, prior, prior salary history could essentially further that uh, um, issue where there was the disparity. And so the legislature put in this law into effect that said, you can't inquire about former salary. Set your salary. It doesn't matter you know, what someone made before, your salary is what your salary is. It does re also require an employer um, upon a reasonable request to provide the pay scale for that position. Um, so, you know, is it, are you offering someone between 50 and 65,000? You don't have to publish that, but if requested by the applicant, you do have to provide it. Remember, PAGA penalties can be sought for non-compliance. So it's not just necessarily we're gonna have one issue. It could be something that's more global, uh, company-wide issues, and anyone who um, has had to do, the unfortunate um, had to deal with pocket lawsuits or claims and um, knows those penalties run up really quickly. And so just remember that um, that is something that applies here. And so making sure that you don't um, ask for prior salary history is very important. Um, recruitment and screening. So you know, you've done your job ads, you've recruited, you've sent out applications or made them available, you've received them back, then what do you do? There, um, you look at the applications, obviously, but there's a lot of things to consider when you're doing that. Um, you know, what there's, I think that there's a lot of people who believe that blind screening of those um, applications can be very beneficial. I'm sure you've all seen the studies where there are studies out of, um, I believe it's Harvard, where, you know, they do, they have people look at applicant applications, um, one blind, one not. And so they do it. Um, this, I think that most of the studies are focused on traditional male versus gender, or male versus female studies. And then most of the, you know, more national origin or race studies where it's, you know, typically uh, white, names versus typically African-American names where, you know, they'll give the applications to the same group of people where one set is blind, there's no names on it or identifying information, and then the other um, set they're given doesn't have names on it. <clears throat> and what they find is that in those studies, males, um, when the, when the identifying names are provided and it's male versus female, typically more males are either called for interviews or um, receive the job offer. And then when it's based on traditional white names versus traditional African-American names, more often than not, there was a higher percentage that went to the um, typically white sounding names. And so instituting some sort of blind process where any identifying information such as name um, is stripped, there are real benefits to that, whether it's something that, you know, you need to do, I think is something obviously to consider within your corporation. But it's an interesting um, study as to, you know, the application or the recruitment process and um, how much the, how much bias can be shown without even knowing it's there. And so, I mean, when you get the applications, you're going to look at them. You're going to ask yourself basically one question. Does this person meet the minimum lawful requirements for this position? Are they qualified? You know, you can put one pile for yes, one pile for no. You then look at the yes pile, and then you figure out who you want to um, interview, making sure you're not focusing on any protected classes, um, that sort of thing. You know, and... I, th I think a lot of you are probably either owners of the companies um, you work for, human resources, whatever it might be. It's really important at this stage um, that someone, whoever is doing the hiring process, if it's not human resources, is working with someone who is trained in human resources, who can point out some of the, these issues that may not you know, occur to 
the supervisor or manager who may be actually doing selecting the people for um, interviews, but you, it's important that someone who is trained to look out for issues um, is at least involved somehow in that process. California Fair Chance, Chance Act, you know, found the box, that's government code 12952. Basically, it says it's unlawful for any employers with five or more employees to ask questions about criminal history on the employment applications. So make it easy, remove it from your application. You can inquire into criminal um, history after an offer has been extended and before the actual hire is completed. So during that conditional offer employment. Zach's gonna talk about that more in depth right in a, just a few minutes. So I'm gonna kind of leave it there. Um, just know it should not be on your application itself. Language restrictions. So these are restrictions on English only policies. So to, I mean, the bottom line is companies shouldn't have English only policies. You can't say, hey, employees, you can't speak anything but English unless there is some business necessity for that. And we'll talk about that at a meeting. You can ask someone if they can speak, read, write, or understand um, English or um, that sort of thing, if it's justified by business necessity. So that's gonna be, depend on what your business is, what the position is, that sort of thing. And so what does it mean for it to be justified? That means it has to be narrowly tailored there has to be some reason why English only is um, necessary. And you have to effectively notify employees of the circumstances and the time when the restriction is required to be observed and the consequences for violating that restriction. And so business necessity, that's it's necessary for the safe <clears throat> and efficient operation of the business. It fulfills some sort of business purpose that it's supposed to and there's no alternative. So what does this mean? So let's say you have a job that, you know, interfaces with the public. You have a storefront where someone is, where the public comes in on a daily basis and you have someone who sits at the front desk. I think it's probably, you know, you would have to look at it, but your specific business for, um, to, you know, to do that evaluation, but positions like that, there probably is a good point for there being a necessity that that person speaks English. They have public that comes in, they have to interact with them. That's probably, you know, requiring that person to speak English while on the floor meeting the public is probably important. You can't then say, however, hey, you, or hey, employee, you can't speak your native language in the lunchroom or on your breaks or that sort of thing. There you have a narrow business purpose. That person interacts with the public. No one else can do that. She's the only one there. Um, and you've narrowly tailored it so it's only when she's performing those job duties. There, there's a good chance, I think, that that would pass the kind of the, the test. However, if you have someone who works in the back who never talks to anyone other than the three people who sit around her and they all speak a different language, you know, that's going to be a harder uh, test to pass because what is the business reason why that person only has to speak English? And so those are the sort of questions that you're going to be asking yourselves if an English only rule is something that you're considering. It can't just be for your convenience or a preference. Um, there has to be a specific, you know, reason why that restriction is being placed. And also, as I said, never during non-work time. Social, social security numbers, technically you can ask for it on the application. I'd ask yourself why you want that information. It's, I don't know that in all that necessary at the early stage. And if you do ask for it, you're going to have to make sure that, you know, the applications are secure so that you avoid an end of um, inadvertent disclosure um, that, you know, to me, it's maybe asking for more trouble than it's worth. But technically, yes, you can ask for a social security number on the application. Just remember that once that person becomes employed, you cannot use their social security number on, you know, identifying information. You, you certainly can have it, you know, you have a W-2 or whatever. Um, but on time cl clock, security badges, identification cards, things like that um, on the wage statements, you, you would you never want to list the entire social security number. You can use the, the last four numbers as an internal um, 
verification or ID number. Social media and personal passwords. You can't ask someone for their password or their social media. That should be kind of obvious. Um, you can go look at people's public interfacing social media. You can do they have a Twitter account. If it's open to the public, great. If they have a Facebook account, Instagram, you know, LinkedIn is used a lot for obviously recruiting. Those sorts of things, you can go look at um, whatever they have public interface. I, I don't know that I would recommend if, you know, someone has a private page that you friend them. That's getting a little um, iffy. But if you are looking at someone's social media, ask yourself why that's infor information you need. Because, you know, if you're looking at someone's Facebook, you might get information that you wouldn't otherwise know and that you may not want. For, for instance, does is the person um in a same-sex marriage not that i mean obviously there's nothing wrong with that but if that person doesn't get the job do they now have a reason why they can say well you didn't hire me because you found out i was in a same-sex marriage and that is the reason you did not hire me so yes you can look at social media just know there might be information in there that you as a hiring person don't want to know prior to making um, that employment offer. So you decided who you want to interview. What do you ask them? Proper interview questions. All about the job and the essential duties of that job. Previous experience, what they've done in the past, why they want to work for your company, what um, sort of promotions they've received, the, their educational background. Those sorts of things are proper interview questions. You know, going back to the job description, review that description, figure out what the person you want is in a way that is relevant to that job description and focus your interview questions on that. Improper interview questions. You know, interviews are hard because here I am telling you, don't ask about people's age, religion, race, marital status, sex, disability. And it makes it sound like, you know, they, they have to be these almost um, benign discussions where there is no talk of someone's life outside of work and you can't get to know the person. And how do you figure out if this person's a good fit for the company without having these discussions with them? And it's hard. I mean, I find myself and when I'm talking to potential um, interviewees at the firm, it's hard because you want to Someone says, oh, I have young kids. I have young kids. I want to talk to them about their young kids, but that could be potentially problematic. So it's kind of finding that balance between making yourself and your company seem like a cold, uncaring place versus protecting the company from liability by asking questions that you're not entitled to know. And that's why the key is focusing on the job and what the job requires. And that um, as long as you do that, then you should be in a pretty good place. So here's another poll for you, uh, Ramona, if you want to put it on. While well, interviewing applicants, an, an, an interviewer can inquire what salary, salary an applicant is looking for. Give everyone a couple more seconds, and then Ramona, do you want to? present the results. Good job, guys. Yes, technically, yeah, you can inquire what that salary the applicant is looking for. The key there is it's their choice to provide it. You're not requiring it. Um, you can also ask yourself, do you want to ask that information? Is that inviting something that you don't want to know? But for sure, you can say, hey, uh, what do you want? What, what is it that you're looking for? So just a few um, kind of, you know, danger zones, disabled applicants. An employer may discuss the employee's disability with the effect of his ability to perform the essential function of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. So there you again, you know, as you would be doing with your regular employees, you focus on what the job duties are, what they can do. 
um, and what help they would need to do those job duties. You're not focusing on what their medical condition is. Um, it's all about those job duties. Volunteered information, of course, sometimes you're going to find out information in an interview that you don't want to know. Um, don't ask additional questions about it. You know, kind of say, thank you. We don't make hiring decisions based on blah, blah, blah. Refocus the conversation on something that is an appropriate area to talk about. Notes, um, obviously take notes that you're, if you're interviewing 15 people, you're going to need to be able to uh, view your notes. Just be careful about what um, you're putting in there. You know, it's, well, with respect to the volunteered information, if someone volunteers information that you didn't ask for, note that, say volunteered salary at previous job, volunteered married with kids, that sort of thing. Good notes. As we always say in, with respect to documentation, we like documentation if it's good documentation. But be careful about you know, the subjective notes that you're taking. You know, does that, do, don't write, person seemed young. You could say person seems like inexperienced. That's not focusing on the age, but someone seems young could be. Um, the individual, you know, focus on the, what they say about their experience, about their education, about what they say about job duties. Don't go in kind of into the subjective area that could be evidence in a wrongful termination refusal to hire case. Um, I think we just talked about that. One more poll on this topic. While discussing the hours required of a position during an interview, an applicant says, I can come in early when needed, but I have to leave by 5.30 to pick up my kids from daycare. Should you say nothing? Make a comment about how nice the weather is outside, if the weather outside is ever good again. Let the applicant know it's a family-friendly company. Inquire into the ages, genders, and the favorite foods of their children. Or not politely state that overtime is rarely required and redirect the conversation. Ramona, do you want to run that poll? I think I'm running over on my time, so do you want to release that? Sorry. Perfect. Not politely state that our time's rarely required and move on. You know, there's lots of ways you could respond, but the, the, the key here is not focusing on what they said, but redirecting it in a way that makes clear that you don't make hiring decisions based on whatever protected information they just revealed. So finally, you're going to make your decision. You're going to make it on legitimate business reasons. You're going to make it on what the requirements of the position um, are, you know, you want to consider whether your hiring process and deciding process should be in writing, you know, lots of times you're going to have interviews of five, you know, five or six people at your company might be interviewing a person. Do you want someone to write in an email why they want employee or applicant A versus appli applicant B? Um, to be sure, Documenting some why the non-discriminatory reason why one person was chosen over another, not a bad idea. Um, but if you are inviting email, you know, from all of the different interviewers who are then putting their thoughts into written form in an email, ask yourself whether that's a really good thing. Um, you know, benign information that seems not problematic at all and is in all likelihood isn't meant in some sort of discriminatory manner could suddenly appear, especially if it's coming from people who have not been proper and you know trained as to what can and can't be in these interviews. So things like applicant A seems less energetic. What happens if applicant A was 60 years old? Could that be a reflection of their age? Um, applicant B seems like she would be distracted by her home life. You know, is that the person in the previous question who has multiple young children at home and there's a concern that um, that is going to distract her from her job duties. And so language such as that can be really easily misinterpreted. So really ask yourself if you're asking for um, your employees to give you email feedback on applicants, 
whether that's really necessary and appropriate. And if you are, make sure that they're trained on what should and should not be put in those emails um, and avoid lengthy email discussions about it. And with that, I think we're on to Zach. He's gonna talk a little bit about verifying employee credentials. All right. It looks like I have the screen. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, different ways that you can use to make sure that the applicant is who they say they are. Uh, and we're going to go through some of them here. The most old fashioned one and the one that there aren't any actual prohibitions in the law governing are reference checks. That could be as simple as you looking at their resume and cold calling the companies you see on there and asking if they work there or asking questions about them. It could be like Megan talked about um, requesting references as part of an application and asking for their consent to check those references as part of the application process. All right, but the most important thing, and I will reiterate this as we go because there's a poll coming up and I'm teaching to the test. Uh, do not ask any question of a former employer that you couldn't ask the applicant themselves, either directly or indirectly. Uh, so that just a quick review includes things like protected classes, prior salary, criminal history. It's not something that you want to ask. Uh, there's a process for it, and we'll get into that next. So. The key with reference checks, if you want to avoid getting in any trouble, is to do them for a, a good purpose. Uh, main purposes, uh, if you see unexplained gaps or frequent job changes on the resume and you want to figure out why those were happening, uh, you can certainly ask the applicant. Uh, but if, if it doesn't come up in the interview, you can call and check. Or if you feel like you need to verify what you heard, uh, you can call the employer uh, right before the gap and see if, uh, if there was any issue that might have caused that, that gap. Uh, it also allows you to confirm the accuracy of the information in the resume, uh, similar to calling up a school and confirming that the applicant attended the school. And then this last one, probably not considered as much, but as a litigator, this is something that we look at in the long run. Um, if you're ever sued for something that this employee does on the job and accused of negligent hiring, you want to be able to say, yes, we check this person's references. Even if your testimony is going to be, um, we called up their former employer, we asked uh, if the person was employed there, the former employer said yes uh, and gave us the dates. We asked uh, why they were terminated and the former employer said, um, it's our policy not to give out any information other than that they were employed and, and uh, the dates of employment. That's fine, you've done your due diligence then. So that's a, a good thing to have and potentially to have documented. So how do you do a reference check? Um, asking for consent is good, that can always help uh, negate any issues down the road. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about potential issues when you're being asked for a reference check. Uh, but don't require consent. Consent is generally not valid if it's not voluntary. Uh, yep, yeah, here's our first review. Again, don't ask any questions that you can't ask the applicant of, uh, of the former employers. Um, Try to focus, I would say, on either the most recent employers to learn about the most recent performance or employers prior to unexplained gaps. Um, don't get too crazy calling up really old employers or anything like that. It just seems like it would complicate things, create further issues, plus it's more work. Uh, you can always speak to the applicant again if you need to clarify anything you've learned and document. So there are some potential risks here. Um, if you ask improper questions, you can get a discrimination claim based on what you did calling references. So it's not what Megan was talking about, what you do in the interview. It's not discriminating against an employee. It is discriminating against a job applicant by asking improper questions of a former employer that can bring the same sort of lawsuit. Um, 
if you if any of you have experience with reference checks, you probably have not gotten a ton of information from them. And that's because a lot of people are worried about the risk of being sued for defamation if they say this employee was bad. But California law was recently amended to protect uh, explicitly, even more explicitly protect people who give references. Um, the this is language that I pulled out of the statute so that you can see exactly what is allowed and it kind of gives you a framework for the sort of questions you you can ask if you if the job is very similar to what the applicant is applying for you can ask about the performance if there's an aspect of the former job that matches the qualifications for the job they're applying applying for you can ask about those qualifications um, you need credible evidence, which means you should be asking for someone who hired that person or someone who managed that person, or at least someone who worked with that person. You don't want someone passing on hearsay to you or rumors. Uh, you need to not be acting with malice. So you don't want to be calling up someone because you don't like a job applicant and you're trying to uh, get bad information out of them. And if you're giving the reference, you need to not be trying to get revenge or something along those lines. So you need to be fair and balanced in, in what you're saying. Um, this is key. This is the explicit question that is protected now is you can ask whether a former employer would rehire or even if it's their current employer, you would ask if they had it to do over again, would they rehire this person? And you may want to let the person that you're asking the reference for know that that language is specifically protected by civil code section 47 C uh, that they are allowed to tell you that and then lastly for section 47 C also says that if you if you hear that they would not rehire the person or that the, they terminated the person for cause you're allowed to ask if it was because the employer made a determination that the former employee engaged in sexual harassment specifically. So that's something you might want to add to the end of your list if it seems like an appropriate question, because it is also explicitly protected. All right, here is our poll. While contacting Jane's references after the interview that Megan talked about, the interviewer can ask her, her previous employer if Jane missed a lot of work, was tardy, and or left early frequently because of obligations relating to her children. Let's see if I prepared you well enough for this question. I guess we're just waiting for a few more answers to come in. Ramona, you might just want to call it since it's only true or false, I would guess. Oh, very good. 94% false. Uh, that's right. You could ask about um, attendance issues, certainly, uh, but you, you do not want to ask if it was because of obligations relating to her children, because that gets you into the protected class situation and it gives you a or gives them a potential discrimination claim against you if you don't hire them. All right, so we're moving on uh, to credit reports. Um, there are a cert you can only obtain a credit report if the job meets certain requirements. Uh, and I'll run through these and add a little specifics uh, to each of these or some of these categories. So a managerial position means an exempt, a person exempt from overtime under the executive ex exemption. And we talked about that in some of our other webinars, but essentially uh, it's a determination that the person will be spending uh, more than 50% of their time managing other employees. Uh, so if they meet that exemption, you can do a, a credit check on them. Regular access to social security numbers, dates of birth, and bank or credit card information. This is a pretty specific one. It has to be all three of those types of information, uh, not just one or other similarly uh, private information. For the next category, confidential or proprietary information, that means things like trade secrets or um, patterns or formulas, things that are uh, the company intentionally keeps secret. Um, and that is valuable information to somebody else if it was revealed, that sort of information, then you can do a credit check. 
Uh, and then these last three are pretty self-explanatory. If they're gonna be handling a lot of money, transferring money, paying on behalf of the company, you can obviously check their credit to see if they've mishandled money in the past or have a reason, uh, for instance, large debts that they might mishandle money. Um, you do need to give written notice before doing a credit check. Uh, this is probably, there's a couple of notices here for credit checks. You'll probably want to have an attorney prepare a form for you and you can just reuse it in that way. You can uh, avoid the potential $5,000 penalty for doing a credit check without proper notice. Um, here are the items that need to be in that notice if you want to check the attorney's work or try to prepare one on your own. Um, the other reason to give notice is if you decline to hire someone based on information that was in the credit report, then you also need to give notice. Uh, again, it's something you can have as a form with some blanks to fill in where you provide the name of the credit reporting agency you used. Um, to protect yourself, you, you for people who do these credit checks, employees who do these cre credit checks, you want to have some sort of written procedure to follow um, because the, the statute gives you a defense. If you have reasonable procedures, uh, you can avoid violations of this section with the same $5,000 penalty plus attorney's fees, which could be a lot more. Okay, next we move on to criminal background checks. The key with criminal background checks is timing. So you have to make a conditional offer of employment before you can do any criminal background check. Uh, that means you, you tell or provide some kind of writing to the person, letting them know that you are offering them the position conditional on the uh, results of a criminal background check. Not until you've done that can you do the criminal background check without violating, uh, this is the same check the box statute in the government code that Megan talked about earlier. Um, whoever is handling criminal background check information needs to know that it must be kept confidential. There are some pretty serious penalties if you don't. And you, again, probably want to have a procedure in place for those people so that they know that and so that you have some uh, defense. Uh, and then this sort of runs into the same issue that you want to address in interviews, in uh, job ads. You want to make sure that the assessment is tied directly to the job duties. Um, and there are things the statute requires you to consider. So you don't have to do it in writing or anything like that, but somebody who thinks about this should probably look at this list and consider all these things so that they can later testify that they did consider all these things if it happens. Uh, I won't run through them, you have the, the list there, but it's basically making sure that you're reasonably considering whether that conviction would have an effect on their performance of the job today. There are notice requirements here as well. Um, if you choose not to hire somebody based on what you see in the criminal background check, you need to specify which convictions are disqualifying, provide a copy of the report, give an opportunity for the applicant to dispute the conviction and provide information. Uh, there's a five business day period for them to dispute and if they do, they get five business days to provide additional information which the employer must consider. And then again, you need written notice of the final decision. Uh, you don't need to put anything in writing in any of these notices about your explanation or justification or anything like that. Uh, and then another key here is the Department of Fair Employment and Housing requires you to tell the applicant that they can file a complaint if they believe they're being discriminated against with the department. And if your company has any additional procedures for applicants, you need to make them aware of those as well. There are a couple of things, if you see them on the criminal background check, you don't want to consider, and you definitely don't want to ask about these in any interviews or follow-up conversations. Uh, under California law, these just don't count. Uh, juvenile convictions, arrests that don't result in convictions, any diversion programs, and then convictions that have been expunged, pardoned, dismissed, things like that. Uh, marijuana offenses are becoming less and less of an issue nowadays. We're probably past the period where this would matter, but two years or older, you don't consider those either. 
So while we talk about marijuana, or I guess the more common legalized name is cannabis, um, it is legal in California, but employer it's not legal under federal law, and employers are explicitly allowed to prohibit use in the workplace and prohibit being under the influence in the workplace and possessing it. Um, so you are allowed to do drug testing of applicants. So let's talk about the difference between medical tests and drug tests. Medical tests are much more restricted. Um, they have to be the very last thing you do as a condition of employment. So there's an offer of employment. You've already done your criminal background checks. Now you can do a medical test, but only if it is uh, specifically job related, you can't do it to determine if there is a uh, real disability or the severity of, a dis severity of a disability or anything like that. You'll run into ADA problems for sure. Um, and if you've determined that it is job related and consistent with business necessity, uh, it has to be required of all similarly situated employees. So I know there are um, companies where their employees go to, say, healthcare facilities to do some sort of services, and the healthcare facilities require uh, tuberculosis tests of any contractors coming in. That is a uh, business necessity, it's job related. You just have to make sure that everyone going to those locations is consistently being required to do that medical test. Uh, drug tests are not considered medical tests, so you can require those before making an offer of employment. That's the, the main difference here. A couple other kinds of testing that are a little less common. Don't do polygraph tests. There are probably some states where it is allowed, but uh, not in California. And then psychological or personality tests, you just have to be careful if they're walking the line between what is a medical test and what is not. You probably want to talk to an attorney. Um, the EEOC has said that if it's measuring things like honesty, taste, habits, uh, it's likely not a medical exam, but again, it, it creates an issue and potential liability, so be careful with it and maybe talk to an attorney. All right, my last big topic here is privacy for job applicants information because there is this new law called the California Consumer Privacy Protection Act, I, the CCPA, anyway. Uh, and it's going to change soon because there was a ballot initiative, Prop 24, that uh, changed it. And it's pretty scary. It's got some very strict requirements. It's why you're getting all sorts of weird pop-up accept things on websites, well, in addition to what Europe did recently. Um, so the most important question, the thing you want to ask first is, does it even apply to you or can you not worry about all these requirements? And it, it has some pretty high requirements. So you have to have any of these three requirements and then it, it um, applies to you. Gross revenues in excess of 25 million, which you're doing pretty well. You can probably afford to deal with the requirements. Um, if you receive personal information of 50,000 or more people, which includes job applicant, uh, applicants, it includes employees, it includes customers, but it's a very high number. Uh, or if you're someone involved in selling California residents' personal information, and even then you have to, it has to be more than 50% of your annual revenue is derived from that. So hopefully most of you are breathing a sigh of relief and saying this doesn't apply to me. Uh, but if you're concerned or if it does apply to you, I'll go through a little uh, summary of what's happening here. The biggest thing is that Proposition 24 is changing everything in January 2023. It'll be the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA. For those of you who work with California Public Records Act requests, that's going to be confusing. And the ballot initiative people did not think about that, apparently. Um, most of the provisions that would deal with job applicant information are delayed until January, 2023. Uh, but your pop, whatever, once January, 2023 happens, they will apply to any information collected in 2022 as well. Um, there are some regulations in place under the current CCPA, and there will be more regulations in place in 2023 under the new agency that Prop 24 created. So, this is going to be a changing situation. We've had slides about the CCPA in our 
annual year in review seminar for several years now, and it's going to continue for several more. Um, currently, the only requirements active for, that affect job applicants' information are providing notice at the time of collection. And these are the various things that you have to put in there. Um, and there's also potential liability if, if you get hacked and you did not, if you were negligent in your security procedures for protecting this private information that you're collecting. Obviously, you're going to need multiple experts to talk to here, not just an attorney to deal with this. Now, in 2023, the provisions get uh, much more intense. So the job applicants will be able to obtain any personal information they gave you by requesting it under the statute. Um, sensitive personal information is a new category that its use and disclosure is limited and there's some extra protection for it. You will have to disclose if you're selling any of the information. It seems like it'll be pretty uncommon for most businesses. Um, and consumer or anybody who gives you private information, including job applicants, will be able to opt out of having their information sold. They'll be able to correct inaccurate personal information if they request their information and see something in there. They'll be able to ask you to delete that personal information. There are exceptions there. If there's information you need to hold on to to comply with the law, you will be allowed to hold on to that and deny the request to delete. Um, and then you have to make sure so this is usually targeted at Facebook, um, or it was considered to have been targeted at Facebook. If somebody says, Facebook, don't sell my information, Facebook can't kick you off Facebook or make you a second class Facebook member or anything like that. There's no retaliation for taking any of these steps or using any of these rights. Uh, right now, the CCPA is being enforced by the California Attorney General. Eventually, the CPRA will be enforced by the new agency. Um, currently, there is a 30-day cure period to prevent this civil penalty of up to $7,500. Um, the new agency will actually have an option of allowing you to cure, so it could be more serious. They could just fine you $2,500 for any violation without giving you a chance to cure. The civil lawsuits where individuals can bring a lawsuit for a violation, those there will be a cure period still. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all this because we pretty much went through it already, but if you need something to reference, this lays out what's going to happen in 2023, the, the main provisions that apply to job applicant information. There will be, uh, there are a few more provisions. You're going to definitely want to get legal advice if your company has to comply with these requirements. So those two pages have that list for you. Um, Reasonable steps that you want to consider any business. One, determine whether it applies to you. If you think it might, start mapping all of the data that you collect so that you can make that notice about uh, what you're collecting. Hopefully, a lot of you are doing that already if this applies to you. Um, check your policies and make sure you have some way for applicants to submit the various requests and use their rights under this statute. And that is all I have. Of course, we can answer questions if you have more questions about it later, and I'll turn it over to Kate. Good morning, everyone. As Megan said, I'm Katie Collins. I'm an associate in the Labor and Employment Department. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about what happens at the point where you hire someone and then ultimately how to handle a termination um, if you deem that's what's necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So offer letters, these are not required, but often are used because they're a good tool to lay out what to expect. So if you use an offer letter, it's gonna lay out the terms of the employment. Usually you would include a job title, obviously the information about salary, starting date, benefit related information, kind of just the basic information so that you can clarify what is going to be offered to an employee, what they can expect in terms of starting employment with you. And then eligibility for employment. I know this is something we all deal with quite frequently. You have to verify that they're either a US citizen or authorized to work in the US. We do this by using the form I-9. 
Um, it's important to know though that you cannot ask for or require additional or alternative identification and work author authorizations beyond that specified by the U US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So another note is you must on honor documents that appear valid on their face, but you cannot ignore and accept documents that appear to be fraudulent. So use your best judgment, obviously review the documents that are provided to you through the use of the I-9 form. If something seems fraudulent, it's important that you catch that and take the steps necessary to consult with legal counsel, determine if the document is in fact fraudulent, if it's gonna cause an issue with you offering the job to the individual. And then the many statutory rights afforded to employees. So obviously once the person is onboarded and they're brought on as an employee, they immediately get all of those rights under the statutes that we're all very, very familiar with. <laughs> and you must be knowledgeable as to all of their rights to ensure that you're not asking questions or requiring information that may interfere with those rights. So as Megan talked about previously in terms of the interviewing process and all of that, that continues to the point where you can't infringe on someone's privacy. You have to be very careful what you're saying for harassment and discrimination reasons, obviously. Reasonable accommodations, you wanna be very cautious of asking someone about medical information or anything of that nature. So the laws protecting against retaliation, basically anything and everything that we talk about in all of our seminars, civil rights, discrimination, harassment, retaliation, labor code, wage issues, OSHA, FMLA, CFRA, we throw all of these letters and acronyms at you, um, but obviously pay close attention to anything that might interfere with, a, with these rights and re don't retaliate against anyone who, um, is, just, is bringing up these issues with you. And then various laws governing disabilities and medical leaves. These are obviously things that we get into quite extensively in our other webinars that are focused on leaves themselves. But when you onboard someone, obviously throughout their employment, be very cautious of the fact that they are afforded these rights, they have access to these leaves if they qualify for them, if they're deemed an eligible employee. So always have these things in the back of your mind when you're having discussions with employees. And then it goes on, as we know, as we've all updated our handbooks and made sure we're in compliance, I'm sure. Um, they're, you know, paid organ and bone marrow donate, donors get leave, domestic violence, school suspension, military spouse leave. I, it's important that when you onboard and just throughout people's employment, you're very familiar with all of the different types of leaves that they qualify for so that you can ensure that you're meeting all of those obligations leave entitlements. If an employee is eligible for a statutory leave of absence under a particular law, a supervisor must provide that leave, even if it interferes with the op operations of the supervisor's department. So this is something, like I said, we go into quite detail when we deal with our leaves webinar that focuses on FMLA, CFRA, all of that. But it's important that you, obviously, as the owner or manager of your company, and also any supervisors that are dealing with your employees directly, know that you can't just tell someone they cannot take a statutory leave because it's inconvenient for your business or because it interferes with what your supervisor is trying to do with their department. Anytime any sort of leave is brought up, it's important that you go through the process, you go through the steps, you refer to the law, and you make sure that you're handling it appropriately. Reasonable accommodation. This is obviously something that we always assess on a case-by-case -case basis. Anytime anyone brings up something that might be considered a disability or might impede their ability to do their work, we need to go through that interactive process. Um, supervisors and employees should not play doctor. Obviously there's a restriction on the amount of medical information that can be in obtained. Courts do not like employers to focus on challenging an employee's claim disability or medical condition. So at the early stages, if an employee brings up a disability or a medical condition, you need to not, not try to rebut that, not try to play doctor, not try to say that doesn't seem like a real disability or anything of that nature. You need to immediately step to the side, start the interactive process and go through the steps accordingly to make sure that you're meeting those requirements. Um, reasonable accommodation requires assessing the employee's work restrictions due to the disability and the essential functions of the employee's job to determine if it can be performed with or without an accommodation. So I know you've heard of us talk about this a lot before. The important part here is the essential functions. So a lot of times we have a job that, yes, we do a wide variety of things, 
but we need to focus on what the essential functions of that job are and can they be, be performed with the disability or with the work restrictions in place. So go through that process, take the interactive steps um, to ensure that you're meeting your requirements there. Medical information, as I said before, employers should not ask about or seek information concerning employees' medical information. There are limited exceptions for medical leaves or reasonable accommodation analyses um, when we ask for certain certifications from doctors and things of that nature. But overall, it's important that we not impede the privacy there. Any documentation that's received regarding a, an employee's disability or an employee's medical condition must be kept confidential. Um, it's obviously important that these documents be kept in files that are sealed, you know, some sort of a locked file cabinet or something of that nature, um, and not disclosed to anyone else at the company. Employers cannot request or be in possession of an employee's or his or her family member's genetic information. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Gina or Cal Gina at this point, um, but it's important that you note that anytime you're collecting information for a medical leave or for reasonable accommodation, the genetic information should be nowhere on that. And then best practices for compliance. Train your supervisors and managers. This is something, another very important webinar we present on is the importance of training your supervisors and managers. When managers and supervisors are not trained on the law, on what is required of them in dealing with employees, that's where liability pops up. Um, employer liability in employment cases is often based on conduct of a supervisor that is not falling within the company's policies that they've created, their handbook. The supervisor is kind of acting on their own because they haven't been trained to realize the importance of all of the statutory rights that are that employees should be provided. It's also important to note that actions and inactions can cause this liability. So an employer does, or a supervisor does not have to take an action. It could instead be them sitting on their hands and not telling anyone that an employee brought up a disability or an employee brought up a reason for reasonable accommodation. Um, it's important that they know what, this, what steps they're required to take when something comes up related to a, a statutory right for an employee. Common pitfalls for supervisors. So failure to understand employee rights and employer obligations, like I said, a lot of times if the supervisors directly are not familiar with all of the rights under the law that employees are afforded, they may not even recognize that something is what it is. When someone brings up a medical condition, they may not even recognize that that is cause for the beginning of the interactive process and potentially a reasonable accommodation. It may just go right over their head and right there is where liability comes into play. Failure to communicate expectations and policies to employees. So this is something that comes up a lot with meal and rest periods. If we're not communicating expectations that these employees take the meal and rest periods that are afforded under the law and under company policy, or if we're not communicating what the company policy is as to meal and rest periods, as to reimbursement for expenses, anything of that nature, that then op opens us up to liability as well. Failure to adhere to employer policies. Obviously, anytime a supervisor is going rogue and going completely outside of what the company has set forth as their policies or what's in their handbook, that's going to present a large issue. Failure to properly document performance problems and other misconduct. This is something that comes into play a lot. Um, documentation, as I'll discuss later on in this seminar, is one of the most important things in rebutting any sort of liability that comes up. Um, especially with performance problems, if supervisors are just talking amongst themselves on a weekly basis or whenever it comes up that they're having some sort of an issue with an employee not performing or going against policy or something of that nature, but it's never documented and they're not writing it down, then it may as well have never happened. Um, then, it, then it comes down to a he said, she said, and it's not nearly as strong as a case where we have someone that was actually documenting every performance issue that came up and any other issue they were having with the employee in real time as it occurred. Failure to consistent de consistently discipline. So this is something that kind of has twofold. For the same reasons I discussed before, if you're not bringing up a discipline issue, if you're not bringing up the performance, 
and it goes on and on and on. And then ultimately all of a sudden you decide to discipline someone for something that they've been doing for a year. That's not consistency. People are going to come up with all kinds of reasons for why all of a sudden you decided to discipline them, which usually are related to discrimination or retaliation, depending on when it's happening in a time frame. Um, another thing, obviously, to be very cautious of is making sure your supervisors are applying discipline the same across employees. So obviously, if a policy is being violated by men and by women, but a supervisor is all of a sudden just disciplining the women for the policy violation and ignoring the men, not disciplining them in the same manner, that's a problem. So making sure everything is being, being applied consistently and equitably is very important. Uh, failure to conduct pre-termination due diligence. So obviously you want your supervisors to be very aware that they cannot just terminate someone out of the blue. They need to go through the process of backing up why this individual is terminated, obviously laying the groundwork through documentation of performance issues, if that's what the termination is for, um, documentation of discipline, if that has happened before. But the big know-all at this point is just to train the supervisors. So make sure that all of your supervisors are extremely familiar with the law, with everything that they are obligated to do, um, and obviously familiar with company policies enough to apply them themselves. And then I'm gonna switch over to poll number five, this effective policies as your guide. So when counseling or disciplining employees, should you, A, enact discipline based on what you believe the workplace policy should be, or B, enact discipline based on what the actual employment policies in place at the workplace are? Oops. It looks like, Sorry about that. We went forward one slide. So we'll give everyone a few minutes here to answer this question. Looks like people are still answering. So I'll just give everyone a second here. Okay, I think that's probably where we're stuck. So it looks like everyone got it correct. It's a pretty pretty obvious one. Obviously, we don't get to make up what the policies are and discipline people based on that. Um, we need to follow what the employer policies are in place. We work very hard to make sure those handbooks are in compliance with the law. Um, any supervisors that you have obviously should be tracking exactly what your policies are as they are outlined in that employee handbook and as they are compliant with the law. So making sure that people aren't just disciplining or writing people up for performance issues based off what they think it should be, but what the actual policy is. And this is what I talked about previously, document, document, document. So lawyers cannot say that word often enough, I find. <laughs> we all agree that the best way to protect yourself is to document everything. Um, document it in real time if possible. It's important to consider who your audience is. So when you're drafting these documents, Ramona, my, sorry about that. I am not able to, there we go. No, I apologize. I couldn't scroll forward, but now I am back in control. So employment documentation, when you're drafting the documentation in real time, you need to consider who your audience is, why you're preparing the documents, and how might they be used against the company in the future. So everything you write down needs to be scrutinized. It should be written in real time, written honestly, obviously incompletely, but think about the fact that someone down the line may see this document, it may be used in a court case, it may be used in some sort of a file that's being prepared to ultimately terminate the employee. Anything that is written down on paper needs to be highly scrutinized and make sure that you are thinking about everything that is being written.
characteristics of good documentation. So as I said before, real time is one of the most important things. We want to be able to establish that this wasn't something that happened two months prior and it was in our memory and we were trying to recall what happened or two years prior and wrote it down. Um, obviously then that's really easy to rebut and say, you know, they didn't remember exactly what happened. They were trying to just go off of memory for however many months or years prior and therefore it can't be as trusted. Um, accurate and complete. As I said before, everything needs to be accurate. We obviously don't want anything written down that didn't happen. We don't want any fabrications. Um, and complete, we sh that's, it's important to remember, especially when we're talking about memory. Yes, it's helpful to jot down notes if in real time or however you may be handling that, but it, it's even more helpful to then look at those notes and expand on them. So if someone looks at that document a year from now, two years from now, they can tell by, based on your chicken scratch or whatever was jotted down in real time, what actually happened. So expand on that so it makes sense. It needs to make sense to another person reading it and be complete to provide all the information. If it's just something that lives in your head that is some short little snippet, that's not gonna be enough if someone's looking at the document down the line and has no idea what's going on. Facts, not conclusions. So we wanna write down real time facts. He said this, I said this. This is what happened next. Just real time, what is happening? What is going on? Um, what policy was violated? All of those things. We don't wanna make assumptions. We don't wanna draw conclusions in our documentation. And then also a lot of times it's important to provide an opportunity for the employee to sign this documentation. So if we're talking about discipline, if we're talking about performance issues, a lot of times employers will write up what exactly happened, what's going on, and have the employees attest to it to make sure that they are on the same page about everything that happened as we are. This gives them an opportunity to dispute something if for some reason they don't agree with what we've said or they think that we are blatantly wrong in one way or another. It's helpful to know that at the time so that we can handle it from there. And then the big no's. So that's kind of what we had talked about before. It's important that we don't draw conclusions, we don't make assumptions, we don't leave our documentation scatterbrained and chicken scratched where no one's gonna know what we're talking about a year from now. Um, you want, we don't do it three years after it happened, we do it in real time. Those things are all important. Um, so at the end of the day, documentation should show who wrote the document, date the document, show the employee's response if there is any, and have a place for him or her to sign and be legible. So this is something as attorneys, I, at least I, I can speak for myself, I guess, my writing is getting worse by the day now that we use computers for so much. And if someone just relied on my chicken scratch notes two years from now, they would probably have no idea what I was talking about. So it's important to remember that, keep it in mind and make sure it's legible. A lot of times, obviously this day and age, we just type everything anyway. So make sure any handwritten notes are ultimately transferred into some into typing, into some sort of form that other people are going to be able to read and understand. The danger of emails. So this is something a little bit different than the documentation that we were talking about before. If you write something down and send it to another, you are stuck with it. An email lives forever. <laughs> so take a moment and think before you click send. I know a lot of times we work in professions where we're shooting off tens of thousands of emails a month, obviously just, clicking send, running through it, something pops in our head, we're sending out an email. I think as lawyers, especially, we take a step back and we want everyone to think about what you're writing. Don't just jot down the first thing that comes to mind and send it off. Um, you are then stuck with it. If you say anything that was that could be deemed discriminatory, harassing, retaliating, anything of that nature, yes, you might not have meant it that way, um, but if you actually take the time and look at it and look what you're writing, and make sure that you are fully comfortable with wherever that email may end up one day, that can save you a lot of trouble later on. And yeah, this obviously every email that you send may ultimately become part of a part of an employment litigation case, part of a personnel file. Emails don't just stay in the world of Outlook. They ultimately can get printed out and used for support and different things. So pay close attention to what you're saying. And then we're going to move to poll number six. Which of these e emails would not be considered dangerous? The first one says, the applicant has impressive experience, but I asked her if she had children or family commitments that would interfere with her work since her husband also works. 
The second one says, I'm fed up with Bob and his disability, and I'm not going giving him any more time off. It is clear he has a doctor in his back pocket. Third one says, I would like to invite all of our employees' children into the office for Halloween trick-or-treat event. Fourth one says, I told Julie to stop sharing with her coworkers how much she makes and told her if that she didn't that if she didn't stop, she will be terminated. So for this poll, we want you guys to tell us which of these would not be considered dangerous. So which of these emails would not pose an issue? And we'll give you a few seconds to respond. I know these are long, so it may take a few moments here. And these are also just good examples of things that people wrote in real emails, but didn't think about the implications later on of what they would say or how they would be perceived. Okay, it looks like we have about 56% participation, but I think that's what we're stuck with. So most everyone got it right. The answer is C. I would like to invite all of our employees' children into the office for a Halloween trick-or-treat event. Um, that obviously doesn't pose an issue here. It's just opening the door to anyone and everyone um, to come in and attend a, a Halloween trick-or-treat event. The first one, it looks like some of you selected the first one. That would be considered dangerous because we're talking about asking someone, this is something that Megan talked about early on, we shouldn't ask an applicant if she has children or family commitments that are going to interfere with her work since her husband also works. Um, that's obviously something that would pose a wide variety of issues, especially ultimately if we declined that applicant and did not offer her the job purely because we thought she might be the one responsible for picking up the kids after school uh, because her husband also works. So just things to consider. Take a, take a Second, think about what you're sending. Make sure that you are comfortable with it and that it's not going to pose any problems later on. And then due diligence before taking adverse action. This is what I was talking about before. We want to make sure that we are not just jumping to termination. Make sure that you've taken the steps and, and ensured that the action is appropriate before doing it. And we're gonna switch over to poll number seven here, which is don't hide the ball. Doesn't look like it's, okay, there we go. Supervisors, if you identify an issue, address it quickly and document everything in a clear and straightforward manner. So as we talked about before, make sure that everything is being documented, that it's clear and straightforward, and then make sure that everything is happening consistently. So don't um, discriminate in the way that you're applying discipline or things of that nature. So this is actually a true or false. You should be vague in describing potential consequences or implication of an employee's behavior problem or policy violation. So this is asking true or false. It, you should basically just throw out there very vague descriptions of what ultimately might happen to an employee because of a policy violation or behavior problem. And it looks like most everyone is getting this right. It's a very straightforward question, so I would hope so. <laughs> Especially since the answer is right above. Uh, we do not want to be vague. We want to be extremely clear and straightforward. Vagueness is not going to be to our benefit. Okay. And considerations in disciplining an employee. I'm sorry, the clicking is having a. Ramona, can you get us back? I don't know what happened. Back to the considerations. Thank you. So, when disciplining an employee, consider the nature of the issue. Are we talking about a performance dis dis deficiency, a misconduct, a policy violation? What is the issue here we're dealing with? What's the severity of the issue? And then, what are the implications? Oh, it went, thank you. <laughs> um, what are the implications of that? So, obviously, if we're talking about a policy violation that is something relatively minor versus something that is extremely serious and maybe related to safety, 
consider all of those things when determining what kind of discipline may be appropriate for the employee. Also take into account prior disciplinary issues. So are you disciplining an employee that has had an issue every month for the last year, or is this the, the employee's first infraction? Um, take into account a disability. So are we noting a performance deficiency because the employee has a disability that we're aware of and isn't being appropriately accommodated? Um, that's obviously something we're gonna to wanna to be very aware of when we determine what discipline, if any, to um, put on the employee. Legitimate non-discrimination, non-retaliatory termination. So this is something that we always focus on in all of our lawsuits that we ultimately deal with for employees that were terminated. The reason for termination must be entirely unrelated to the employee's protected class or protected activity. I'm sure you're all very familiar with what those terms mean. Protected class um, can have to do with their gender, their race, religion, all of that. Protected activity has to do with if they had complained about wages, if they had complained about not being provided a leave, and they were entitled to under the law, whatever that may be. If you're going to terminate someone, your reasons for doing so cannot at all be related to any of those things. This is extremely important and what we use to rebut all of the employees' allegations later on that they were terminated for unlawful reasons. Best practices before termination. Review the personnel file, the entire thing, start to finish. Make sure that you're aware of everything that has happened, regardless if it happened before you were employed. If you're an HR manager and you came in after this employee had already been around for 10 years, make sure that you look at everything that has happened in this employee's history with the company. Have the important conversations. Talk to the direct supervisor. Talk to everyone that's dealing with this employee on a, at a manager level and make sure you're completely familiar with what's going on, the reasons for termination, make sure that there's no discriminatory animus around that. And then risk assessments. A lot of times this is when people approach legal counsel or bring in other management or HR individuals to determine the risk with terminating an individual. So if you're terminating someone that just got off of maternity leave a month ago because you find that she hasn't been performing to the same level of work or terminating someone that got a disability a year ago and has been having seizures and missing a lot of work due to that. Those are things you're going to want to be very, very cautious of and have someone, either legal counsel, HR management, someone of that nature, do a full risk assessment before you ultimately terminate the individual. These are things that will save you a lot of time and money later on when this employee turns around and says, I wasn't terminated because of all my performance issues, I was terminated because I was on a leave or because I have a disability. Um, pay close attention to those things and make sure you are covering your bases before ultimately terminating someone. And then parting words, in the business world, the rear view mirror is always clearer than the windshield. I think that's a great statement to kind of follow what we just talked about with the termination. Take the steps, make sure you're doing everything right the first time. Um, obviously, it's, it's much better if you handle it right the first time rather than looking back in your rear view mirror and realizing that it was handled all wrong. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. So we are out of time, so we're not going to have much time to answer questions today, unfortunately. You can always call Zach, Katie, or me to have, if you have any questions, we're happy to talk to you. I did see the question in the question and answer having to do with terminating an employee for um, reporting to work while sick and eventually testing positive for COVID. And termination decisions are really hard for us to discuss um, in a setting like this. Um, we usually need a lot more information before we talk about, you know, yes, you can terminate. No, you can't. Um, um, call Katie, call Meg, or Megan, call me, call Zach. We're happy to talk to you. Um, I, I will just say this, based on the fact pattern you gave, I would ask you, have any other employees ever came to work sick and have you fired them for that? Um, I think that's going to help guide your answer. Um, obviously, terminating people um, after they've come down with COVID that's an inherently risky situation. So I would proceed very cautiously and I'd really recommend you consulting with legal counsel before going um, through with it. And Emma, yes, you will receive the PowerPoint presentation, I believe. I know you will receive the recording. I believe the PowerPoint is also sent with that. If for some reason you don't get it, 
contact us, we will get you a copy of that. And with that, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. It was great to um, be able to talk to you for a little bit. And we hope to see you at our next seminar, which Ramona, I, I think it, I don't know if it was on the PowerPoint. I don't know exactly when it is, but it will be on our website. So if you go to Weintraub Tobin, go to, I believe, the Labor and Employment blog, um, it will be there. And we hope you, hope you can join us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.